Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, second World Cafe of the Global Fellowship Initiative, also known as GFI, at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. For those of you who didn't watch yesterday, my name is Laurent Siero. I'm a reporter and a journalist in residence at the Global Fellowship Initiative. Um, there are many more events. Uh, this is a series of discussions that uh, we are conducting uh, uh, also tomorrow. Uh, with the former and current fellows, but there are many more events linked to the, the GCSP's anniversary. So I'll invite you to, to go on the GCSP's website, uh, gcsp.ch. It's still time to check and register for, for these events. Uh, due to the short format, we won't answer any question today, but we'll, come, we'll collect your comments in the chat box function. And uh, as this session is recorded uh, for GDPR's compliance reasons, uh, those of you who don't want to be identified by their names in the chatbot functions can uh, change their names either into an alias or uh, into initials, uh, for instance. It is now my pleasure to be joined by three distinguished guests, uh, starting uh, with Vincent Bernard in alphabetical order, former editor-in-chief uh, of the International Review of the Red Cross and an expert on humanitarian affairs, law and policy. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Vincent, good to have you. Good afternoon. Nice then to Elisabeth uh, Degré Warner, founder of the NGO uh, Geneva Call, which works uh, with the non-state uh, armed groups and uh, currently one of the, the members of the NGO uh, Leaders for Peace uh, which was founded by the former French Prime Minister Jean-Pierre Raffarin. Good afternoon, Elisabeth. Good afternoon. And finally, Janet Lim, a former uh, Assistant uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees in charge of operations and currently a fellow at the School of Social Science in the Singapore Management University. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Pleasure Good to you. Good to have you all. Uh, so as we did yesterday, we'll start with the first uh, uh, short round with very simple questions. Where were you 25 years ago as the GCSP uh, was launched? And what did security mean to you? Uh, Janet will, uh, no, Vincent will start with you. All right, thank you. Um, 25 years ago, I was in Geneva, I was studying. I was uh, doing the big tech competition on international maritime law. And that these were my training years. The next year I was in Istanbul teaching the law. And then the next year I was in Dakar uh, doing dissemination of the law to you know, armed forces and, and, and the civil society. And so at the time, I think we were all um, overwhelmed by uh, you know, the, the number of crises. There were huge crises uh, going on. Uh, we had uh, the Somalia, Rwanda, former Yugoslavia. Uh, the sit security situation was terrible, and I think uh, respect for humanitarian action was getting very bad with major security incidents at the time. You may remember in Burundi, six colleagues from the ICRC were killed. In Novi Atagi in Chechenia, uh, also colleagues were killed. And it was the beginning of this realization that humanitarian action was getting very dangerous. But at the same time, there was lots of hope um, hope in, in the law, uh, which was not very much respected, but we all thought we could, you know, um, make, make it better known. So that was the start of my work in, uh, in prevention, in disseminating the yeah. law. Uh, so was, we'll, 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 we're going to get more into this. Uh, let's, let's go to that first round, uh, uh, just to assess where, where you were and, and what did security mean to you personally? Elizabeth. Twenty-five years ago, um, I was uh, uh, starting working on uh, the question of the prohibition of anti-personnel mines. It, it was really a security concern because, you know, anti-personnel mines will affect mainly innocent civilians. So I was just starting uh, my engagement on this question. And uh, then uh, the beginning also of Geneva call, because we could see that uh, armed non-state actors were 
more and more involved in conflicts before it was, uh, we could see conflicts between states, but more and more uh, 25 ago, two years ago, and, and then even more, you uh, could see that on non-state actors, rebels, uh, uh, liberation movements and areas were more and more involved in, in armed conflict. And they were yeah. important users of anti-personnel mines because it is a, a weapon of choice for yeah. them. It's uh, easy to manufacture, it's yeah. uh, cheap. So I started uh, my, my engagement, my work on not only pushing on the, the prohibition of anti-personnel mines, but uh, in particular by armed non-state actors. Yeah, we'll get back to that. Thank you. And uh, Janet, what about you? Where were you 25 years ago? Uh, well, I was, I'm going to stretch your generation to a little bit beyond 25 years ago and tell you where I was uh, when I first started my work in the humanitarian uh, uh, area. And this was in the 80s. And uh, I started uh, with the uh, Indo-Chinese uh, refugee uh, crisis that was in the aftermath of the war in Indochina, the end of the Vietnam War. We had huge outflow of uh, boat people. Some, some of you may remember, there was also the Cambodian uh, uh, genocide. Now at that time, you know, my work uh, with UNHCR was basically about protecting refugee and finding solutions for them. And uh, so at that time, I, I, I wanted to bring you to that situation because the security environment then was really quite different. Security for the people we care about is never easy, but we could do something about it. And uh, there was no concern about, you know, the security of uh, the people who, the humanitarian workers. I'll stop there for now. Yeah, but uh, let's uh, get into the substance uh, uh, following up on that, because we'll start with you, uh, uh, Janet. So 1995 was a good year uh, in a way because that was the launch of the GCSP uh, and uh, uh, I think we'll uh, all agree on that. But it was a very challenging year for the international community. We were just one year after the genocide in Rwanda and the same year, 1995, there was the massacre in, uh, in uh, Srebrenica. So huge challenges in humanitarian and, and broader security uh, issues. So Janet, uh, after what you, you just said, do you would you say that the situation had already considerably changed in 1995 in that regard? Absolutely. That's why I wanted to contrast with before, you know, uh, 25 uh, years ago. And in just a matter of a short time, I think that, uh, in fact, uh, the first time that uh, the security of the humanitarian workers were threatened, at least from my own experience, was uh, during the Sarajevo airlift operation. That was the very first time I could remember when uh, 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 humanitarian workers were targeted. And I remember, you know, the horror we felt when one of our staff, you know, working on the Sarajevo airlift was, uh, was uh, targeted by a sniper. That was sort of like the beginning when in humanitarian work where we not only have to be concerned about the security of the refugees or the displaced people, but also our own security. So that Thank was, you. yes, that was, that was the very beginning, I think, of security environment became, becoming more complicated. Yeah. Thank you. This context, Vincent, uh, of uh, Rwanda and then uh, former Yugoslavia, is, is, is that the period where we really understood that prevention, the key word for, for you, was, was very important and that the, the international community failed until that period to think about that? I think it was a, a period of um, um, uh, large crisis. And at the same time, there was a, an urge to, to be more professional, to, to be um, better equipped to deal with all these crises in terms of uh, uh, humanitarian standards. That was the time when all these uh, you know, initiatives to develop code of conduct and work on the principles, uh, avoid instrumentalization, um, strengthen uh, humanitarian professionalism started. So we, there was lots of changes within the sector starting at that time. Uh, and when it came to prevention, there was, you know, this uh, belief that we could make a difference through law. So as I said, it was a period of crisis, but at the same time, a period where we believed in international um, uh, organizations in their 
power to make changes in developing new treaties like the Ottawa Treaty that Elizabeth was. Then we started developing new tools to disseminate the law. We used uh, artists. We uh, started developing uh, all kinds of approaches. We started hiring former military people to disseminate the law to armed groups and armed forces. Thank you. Elizabeth, um, as you said um, a few minutes ago, Geneva Call didn't exist uh, in 1995. Uh, it, would, uh, it would be launched a few years later in, in uh, 2000. Uh, but could you feel already, uh, you, you, you said that, but could you elaborate on, on, on that? You could feel uh, with, with this crisis and uh, the big shift from uh, blocks towards internal wars in many fronts in Africa, but also in other regions, could you already uh, feel the importance that non-state actors would uh, would take? Uh, yes, I, th I think it was obvious uh, for all the people working, for instance, uh, with the international campaign to ban land mines or, or the ICRC. As I, I said, we could see that uh, important users were these armed groups, uh, uh, user of anti-personnel mines. And uh, as you know, an international convention cannot be signed by, by armed groups. Uh, and it means that we had to find another way. Uh, and I, I remember I was really uh, impressed by uh, two colleagues from Colombia and the Philippines saying, you know, in, in our country, uh, this convention will change nothing because the main user will continue to lay anti-personnel mines in the ground and to kill innocent civilians. So uh, I think uh, this is why we, we more and more we were really uh, convinced that it was necessary to, to address this question of armed non-state actors and to find a way how we can engage them uh, on, a, on, a, on a prevention aspect, because uh, it's always important to prevent the use of anti-personnel mines more than to just to provide health care to the victims. So how, how was your uh, ID uh, seen back then by governments and other stakeholders who could be uh, reluctant to see that new kind of actors uh, being empowered through uh, a dialogue with uh, NGO and, and agreements that would be then also uh, uh, validated by uh, the, the Geneva governments, so by public and official stakeholders. I think before the states expressed some concern, they just thought that we were naive, we were stupid, thinking that these groups will listen to us and will respect uh, uh, a prohibition of anti-personnel mines. Uh, I was called the UFO of the humanitarian world. Uh, so it's, it's a nice <laughs> uh, name. Uh, so before it was this kind of a reaction, you are naive, it will never work. Then, then when they saw that it, it was working in, in several cases, yes, they were more concerned about a kind of legitimation, giving, legitimization given to these armed groups which was not the case because we were very clear that it will not change our, our negotiation or the signing of an agreement will not change the status of this, uh, of this group. They will, be, they will not be recognized suddenly because they have signed a, a deed of commitment with uh, uh, an NGO. An NGO is also a non-state actor. So we, we, are not, we cannot bring them more recognition. Uh, so this was the reaction, but I think Progressively, the ICRC also was engaging armed groups. Uh, I think the, the world understood that, the international community understood that uh, it could help for the protection of civilians. You, so you could feel also a shift in that regard, briefly? Uh, you're, you're muted, we can't hear you. Yeah, that's yes. it. Uh, I think um, uh, there was uh, there was there was a window of opportunity to to develop uh, international treaties to develop those mechanisms um, that we don't see today. Uh, that's that's for sure. We we don't have the same environment. There were lots of possibilities at the time. We we saw the development of of all kind of instruments. We mentioned Ottawa Treaty, but also 
we had the, then the International Criminal Court and other treaties. And then today, the environment is much less conducive to the, to the development of, of those rules. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. when it comes to engaging with armed groups, I don't think the environment is very much conducive today either. Um, as we've seen lots of uh, attempts to criminalize uh, the engagement with armed groups. So the environment is, is not, uh, when it comes to engaging with armed groups, unfortunately, I don't think things have improved since then. So probably there was, a, there was a, an interesting window of opportunity at the time, despite all the crises. Yeah, so let's go that, uh, to, to the current state of play with that uh, particular component you just mentioned. Uh, and uh, I, I get back to uh, Elizabeth afterwards. But maybe, Janet, is it also something that uh, you observe right now with, uh, uh, with concern, the, the growing uh, uh, criminalization of uh, humanitarians? As we're facing more protracted crises, more complexities, uh, is, is that both components that concern you the, the most? Absolutely. I, I mean, I fully agree with Vincent and Elizabeth that, you know, in, a, a general, in, in 1995 and the years after, there was a lot of uh, discussions and debate about, you know, prevention, about, you know, opening new avenues and, you know, uh, and certainly the UN, perhaps a bit slowly, recognized the need to speak with non-state actors and so on. I think all of those were very good, but operationally on the ground, things were really not improving. You know, it was, uh, I mean, because I was in charge of operations, I could feel that, you know, it was much more difficult, slowly getting more difficult to get access to the people we need to protect. And usually, you know, the best way to protect people is to be your, well, by your presence with them. And then access was limited also for the humanitarian workers. So, you know, security wise, unfortunately, with all of the efforts that have been made with trying to, you know, uh, 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 increase the awareness of IHL, refugee laws and everything on the ground, unfortunately, things were not changing uh, uh, as fast. And uh, I think that uh, the situation we have today is really, uh, if, if I compare to when I first started working, you know, it's much more it's much more complicated, and I really feel sorry for the colleagues who are working in the uh, today. To be honest, yeah, Elizabeth, do you do you share that uh, that feeling? And it's not only that the humanitarians are more and more targeted; it's that the humanitarian uh, field by itself is uh, threatened by also more restrictive laws, right? Um, yes, uh, you are right. I think the the first point is that also. The, the kind of, of uh, the, the actors uh, involved in armed conflict are also uh, different today. Uh, I know particularly the question of armed non-state actors. Today, these groups are more difficult, you know, to identify what is the structure, the chain of command. They are more, very often more violent. Uh, they perhaps among the, the combatants, there is no longer an, an ideal uh, but they are mercenaries just making money, not fighting for a cause. Uh, so it changed uh, everything. And, and, and I think it's uh, in, in many conflicts, it's much more violent. And with, we can see that uh, the target of civilian, of hospital, of schools is more and more frequent. So this is the first aspect. The second aspect is the, the lack of compliance with IHL. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, international humanitarian law is not respected, but the, the, the worst aspect is there is no sanction. Uh, states or non-state actors can, you know, bomb a school. There is no reaction, no sanctions. And I think this is a, the second problem on, on the question of security. And the third one is already mentioned, the criminalization of humanitarian workers, because in states would like to make the world safer in adopting counter-terrorist measures, but at the same time, they, you know, uh, they are, it, it has an impact on uh, the humanitarian workers, on access, on on negotiation with armed groups listed as so-called terrorists. So I think these three aspects are, are really making uh, the 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 the, in, the involvement and the work of humanitarian actors more and more difficult. And more and more dangerous. Yeah, Vincent, what what what's the diagnosis that you're making? Uh, huma international humanitarian law has been targeted more than ever. That's uh, what we can hear sometimes by uh, ICRC President Peter Maurer. But you're the the 
the, the best uh, person to uh, dig into that and, and to elaborate on that? Well, I, I would say um, we would like to see, uh, we, we are interested in seeing the changes. But in fact, if you look at Nagorno-Karabakh, if you look at Syria, you look at uh, Ethiopia today, you might have problems that have not changed, uh, in fact. You know, they are the same problems as we've seen 25 years ago. Um, the humanitarian response has not changed dramatically either, uh, in the sense that you have the, the same kind of uh, actions being deployed. Um, so uh, our perception of that has changed, and we have more tools now to understand the complexity of crisis. Uh, so there is also a change in the humanitarian sector in the sense that it, it became truly global and it is much bigger. I mean, for instance, just the ICC uh, doubled its budget over the last six years, I think, seven years. So you have a much bigger humanitarian sector. You have um, lots of technical uh, uh, responses which are possible. you got a kind of uh, better grasp of the complexity. We, have, we are better informed as well. So we are constantly, you know, uh, exposed to this kind of uh, uh, violence and, and violations of IHL. Uh, but actually, if you look at facts, the violations are more or less the same as before. And actually, we have also not perceived the progress and there's been a lot of progress at the level of, um, you know, um, legal training, um, possibility to repress violations, uh, just like Australia did like very recently uh, you know, um, about the war crimes committed by its own troops. So you, you see there is progress, but they are, they are maybe uh, less, we, we perceive them less than uh, the big violations which are still occurring today. Elizabeth, uh, let's uh, try now to assess what could be uh, the next generation. Uh, we saw uh, uh, with the COVID that some uh, non-state armed groups uh, responded favorably uh, at first to uh, uh, UN Secretary General appeals uh, for a ceasefire and other trying to get uh, gains from that situation. So how do you think the, the, the new normal with the COVID uh, and all the, the restrictions related and the effects will impact uh, non-state armed groups in the short term? And maybe in the, let's try to assess in the longer term also with the uh, the challenges related to technology, um, how do you see that? Difficult question because uh, we can anticipate uh, some elements, but then the future will uh, show that it will be totally different. So <laughs> uh, it's always difficult to, 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 to anticipate and to, 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 to predict how it, it, will, it will be. I, I think um, the, the question of, of COVID uh, could show us uh, that we have to work all together. Multilateralism, multilateralism is more and more important, despite the fact that the nationalism is, is becoming, you know, uh, stronger in, in, many, in many countries. So uh, multilateralism is more and more uh, uh, important in this kind of, of time because we, we could see that the pandemic will will not stop when uh, the, the virus uh, reach the, the border. So uh, I think it, it, we have really to, to work on this question of multilateralism and, and respect of humanitarian law, which is a very good example of multilateralism, as all the countries in the world uh, signed the, the Geneva Convention. Um, on, on the question of armed non-state actors, I think, again, uh, there are so many different groups that it's difficult to, to, to anticipate. I think for some of them, really um, having the objective to protect the civilians under their control, and there are several armed groups really with this, with, with this objective just to, to, to better protect civilians and to provide them uh, uh, an, an environment which is uh, healthy and, and, and living, allowing people to live in security. Uh, I think they, they will really try to respect all uh, the, 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 the advices given by the, the WHO. Um, for others, uh, they will use this opportunity to, to disseminate more fear and, and to use uh, this kind of, of uh, pandemic to, to reinforce their presence and the, the fear among civilians, pushing them even to... to, to 
to, to join you know, refugee camps or IDP camps. So uh, again, I think you don't have one kind of armed non-state actors and you cannot just anticipate. But I think it's important to consider that uh, we have still, despite the difficulties, we have still to, to try to engage them and to work on prevention uh, with them because we will face other problems uh, probably in the next uh, in the next years yeah uh, janet uh, we have to work together uh, just said uh, elizabeth and and uh, un uh, high commissioner for refugees filippo grandi recently say look the the complexities are so high that the humanitarian uh, uh, stakeholders cannot tackle this kind of situation alone anymore uh, there have been some attempts in the recent years to uh, not merge but to get uh, humanitarian development and, and peace holders closer together. Uh, do you think that COVID is, will be a critical moment in order to move forward in that regard? And, and how do you see the next 25 years more broadly for uh, um, refugees and for humanitarian uh, uh, affairs? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, it's, uh, we really need to change the way we look. I mean, you know, humanitarian problems are no longer, you know, problems in isolation, nor are they short term. We have now a lot more protracted situation and worse. I mean, these protracted situation last over a generation. In 25 years, we would have several generations of uh, you know, people who, uh, who, who are stuck in, in displacement. So if we continue to work the same way, it's just it's not going to, uh, uh, to help at all. And uh, definitely now, I think we need to take into account the fact that if people are going to stay a long time where they are, there will be a lot of security implication if we leave them where they are. There will be security implication, not only for the refugees or the displaced people, for the community at large, but also for the world at large. So I think now the, 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 the new approach that UNHCR is pushing very much is that we have to start thinking about long-term uh, 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 program for, for these people. And of course, I mean, in the country where they are, it's never easy for, the, the host community to accept them. So what do we do? We need to look at development of the whole, uh, you know, not only just of the refugees, but also of the hosting community. Uh, so there are many, you know, uh, 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 that we really need to move in a different direction. And so it makes perfect sense that uh, we need now to look at uh, humanitarian uh, uh, crisis in the context of this longer term framework and to see where development can help today. One thing that I think is very important, which I think that uh, UNHCR has been stressing a lot, is also education. That's the only way to lift people out of, uh, you know, uh, 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 where they are, you know, uh, because in the past, we used to just prioritize the immediate uh, uh, needs like food, water, sanitation. And we think that, you know, issues like education, you know, can be resolved after we have met those needs. I think that's no longer possible because you can't wait until the generation is over before you start educating them. Well, so I want, I want to hear you also on that, but uh, also on, on the impact of technology because ICRC is working a lot right now uh, on uh, privacy uh, questions for for that are more and more relevant for the the people they uh, they assist. So on both questions, how do you see the next twenty five years and and uh, probably the need to uh, to reinforce also uh, uh, the law? Yes, um, I would say. Um, uh, there is a need still to keep a space for humanitarian action, which is, uh, let's say, separate from the um, development agenda. I would really think that there is a need for, you know, a capacity to uh, still deliver humanitarian action and, and separate from other agendas that the international community may have, because we may see, uh, again, international armed conflicts. We may see, you know, um, situations where you need the, the capacity to operate across the line. So I think it's something we, we need to keep in mind. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to the law, uh, we are not at a very good uh, time when it comes to, do, to developing implementation mechanisms. At the same time, we've seen development in the field of uh, weapons law. So this is still happening. There are still developments when it comes to the uh, limitations of uh, new weapons. 
and this has been a drive since the beginning of the the, the humanitarian uh, sector, but also the development of international humanitarian law to follow technologies. And uh, in that domain, we still see some developments happening, some reflections taking place when it comes to robotics and warfare, cyber warfare. And uh, of course, humanitarian actors also now have more technologies available and they try to think about, you know, um, how they can harness technology, just like they, they used to do 100 years ago, harness technology for better humanitarian outcomes and also protect um, uh, uh, victims in a new way, including their data, including their privacy. And that's, uh, these are very interesting developments which we will see in the, in the future because there are obviously uh, new needs um, and uh, people need to, uh, to have the access to their data, for instance, when they are on the move. And so how do you make sure that you, you help them also in, in, in this way? Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much for having agreed to participate. And actually, we did even better than yesterday because we're right on the thirty minutes uh, limit that uh, we decided for these very informal talks, but very, very stimulating. Thank you once again, Vincent, Elizabeth, and Janet, and thank you to all our uh, viewers. Uh, for having joined us today. And just to remind you that there will be a third discussion tomorrow on uh, the regional perspectives in Middle East and in Africa. Um, thank you once again and happy birthday to the GCSP.